Iran has evidence that Washington is providing direct support to Islamic State. That's the claim made by the deputy chief of the staff of the Iranian army. It comes in the wake of two terror attacks in Tehran last week, both claimed by ISIL, but Iran says they were only possible because of Saudi and U.S. support for the group. Both Riyadh and Washington have denied any links to the terror attacks, but Iran is not convinced. The country's supreme leader went further, saying the attacks would increase hatred towards Saudi Arabia and the United States. Well, the U.S. president has weighed in on the issue. He uh, released a statement expressing his condolences over the de deadly attacks, but in the very same message said that that's what happens with states who sponsor terrorism. It is a criticism he's made before. For decades, Iran has fueled the fires of sectarian conflict and terror, threatening the region and causing so much violence. All nations of conscience must work together to isolate Iran. There is a growing realization among your Arab neighbors that they have common cause with you and the threat posed by Iran. And it is indeed a threat. There is no question about that. In Saudi Arabia's eastern city of Qatif, an army major has been killed in what the government's calling a terror attack. The interior minister has identified the victim as Officer Tariq Al-Qati Al Al Two others were injured when their patrol came under a bomb attack. The province has been hit by a series of terrorist attacks in recent weeks, with a car blast in the region just a week ago. Iran is now sending five planes of food to Qatar following the Gulf nation's crisis with its neighbors. Qatar's land borders are now closed and it's having difficulty getting food shipped in by air and sea as well. According to an Iran air spokesman, the national carrier has flown out 450 tons of perishable food to Qatar and is sending another plane today. They're also sending ships loaded with 350 tons worth of food. In related news, Hamas has announced that its chairman Ismail Haniya is going to visit Iran, one of the terror organization's main sponsors. Now that Qatar is under pressure to cut its support for Hamas, the Islamist terror group may have to turn to their mutual ally to make up the difference. Recently, Hamas leaders visited Cairo as well to meet with Egyptian officials, and they're claiming they came to new understandings with the neighboring country. It's the 10-year anniversary of Hamas's 2007 coup, but few are celebrating. Israel withdrew unilaterally from the Gaza Strip in 2005 under then-Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, ceding control of the area to the Palestinian Authority. Later on, in Palestinian legislative elections in 2006, though, Hamas won a majority. Under pressure from the West, however, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas kept Hamas out of the Palestinian Authority, despite the electoral results. In response, Hamas launched a bloody coup in Gaza, even throwing several leading Fatah members in Gaza off 15-story high buildings. Fatah was forced out of Gaza, and since then, Hamas has strictly ruled over the territory, using it as a base for attacks on Israel and maintaining a hardline rejectionist stance. Ten years later, the Gaza Strip lacks a regular supply of drinking water, and now that Abbas is refusing to pay its electricity bill, the lights are off too. It looks like the residents of Gaza are going to be experiencing that extra power shortage after all. Israeli officials are confirming that the security cabinet has agreed to meet the demands of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and further cut electricity to the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. Reportedly, this was a difficult decision for Israel to make. While putting pressure on Hamas does advance Israeli interests, there are concerns that further reducing electricity could push Gaza into chaos. Right now, there's only power to Gaza for about six hours a day. Now that the Palestinian Authority will pay $7 million a month for electricity for Gaza instead of around 11, it'll be more like three to four hours a day. Kogat head Yoav Mordechai is concerned about an escalation with Hamas as well, but according to officials, still favors adopting a policy in line with Abbas's. One thousand eight hundred American rabbis have just called on Israel to end the occupation and lay the groundwork for peace. The organization Tru'a, the rabbinic call for human rights, delivered a letter to the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. last Friday on the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War. The letter said that the Tru'a members are rabbis and cantors, quote, 
who hold deep love for the State of Israel and who believe that the vision of the Hebrew prophets cited in Israel's Declaration of Independence for a homeland committed to peace and justice represents the most powerful guarantee of Israel's future." End quote. The letter continued with, We went to the embassy as Zionists and as lovers of Israel, but as much as we celebrate Israel's victory 50 years ago, we conveyed to Israeli officials our belief that the occupation of the territories captured during the Six-Day War has inflicted misery and vast injustices upon millions of Palestinians. In the name of Jewish values and for the sake of Israel's democracy, we urged the government of Israel to take all possible steps to end the occupation. In Germany, four men have been arrested on suspicion of having links to terrorist groups. That's amid intensified security raids across the country. Peter Oliver has more. Well, dawn raids took place in the suburb just to the south of Hamburg, um, the northern port city here in Germany. Uh, police special forces going in there and arresting four men. Um, they're aged between 39 and 51. They are, according to uh, local reports, strongly suspected of being members of the Jihad al-Nusra terrorist organization. Now, they are a Syrian refugee family that have been living in the area since 2015. Local residents have been talking to media. Uh, they're saying that they were a quiet family, that one of them worked as a delivery driver, that they pretty much kept themselves to themselves. But the German interior minister has said that the, the terror level here in Germany remains high, but at the moment it certainly wasn't going to be lowered or raised. You can read into that whatever uh, you want to. But certainly Germany on full alert uh, following a series of terrorist attacks that took place in the United Kingdom. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said on Saturday that putting up walls will not solve problems caused by immigration. Merkel made the comment in Mexico City at a panel discussion alongside Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto in a bold snub against US President Donald Trump and his pledge to build a wall along the US border with Mexico. What can we do? First, you must fight against the causes that motivate people to leave their homes. And building walls doesn't help. You have to try to create at least a new view that will improve the lives of people in their countries. You have to speak with the affected governments so they can give new perspectives to their use. Now to the U.S. drone strike taking out militants from the terror group Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And we're learning more tonight about that apparent insider attack on U.S. troops in eastern Afghanistan. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, the U.S. striking a terror target, an unmanned drone hitting Al-Shabaab militants in Somalia. The Pentagon estimating eight militants killed, one of the Al-Qaeda-linked group's main training and command posts destroyed. These airstrikes, the first under President Trump's new authority given to carry out offensive actions in the area. This comes just one day after three American soldiers were killed in Afghanistan. New details emerging on the insider attack. The Army soldiers on a mission supporting Afghan special forces when an Afghan soldier turned his gun on them, killing two instantly, the third succumbing to his injuries, a fourth soldier wounded and medevaced to safety. The Pentagon is investigating these killings. There have been more than 150 deaths from an insider attack since 2007. It was a show of military might and tactical unity. More than 7,000 troops from 22 countries participated in Jordan's 7th annual Eager Line military exercise, the largest ever. The majority of the forces who took part were Jordanian and American, fueling speculation of an imminent joint ground offensive inside Syria targeting ISIL. Jordan is a member of a U.S.-led alliance to defeat the armed group. Its Air Force has bombed dozens of ISIL targets, and under President Donald Trump, the U.S. Army has become increasingly engaged militarily on the ground in Syria. Jordan remains a key partner in the U.S.-led coalition in the fight against ISIL, both in neighboring Iraq and Syria. In 2015, the U.S. government promised to increase overall aid to Jordan from $660 million to over a billion dollars, and that amount is set to increase. 
Jordan has mostly been spared the large-scale attacks ISIL has carried out elsewhere. But in December, its biggest crusader, Eric Castle, was stormed by the armed group, killing 10 and injuring 27. The government continues to face criticism over its handling of the assault and is under increasing pressure to do more to combat ISIL. Whether Jordan will send ground soldiers into Syria to target ISIL is unclear. But what's certain is it's readying itself for a fight. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been arrested while on his way to anti-corruption protests that he spearheaded in Moscow. He urged Russians to join the demonstrations, which are currently underway across the country. Navalny is a longtime Kremlin critic who's hoping to unseat President Vladimir Putin in next year's election. His video on alleged corruption connected to Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev caused mass protests in March. The website of Egyptian journalist and government critic Khaled Albashi was blocked on Sunday with no warning as part of a recent state crackdown on news websites that are critical of the current regime. Balshi's website, Al Badea, was a rare dissident voice in Egypt. It was the 57th website blocked since May 24th. Egyptian journalists see the move as a step toward banning all but the most state-aligned media, reversing the trend of private media that sprung up during the final decade of former President Hosni Mubarak's rule. Some say the government, led by general-turned-president Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, is attempting to ensure that opposition candidates during the 2018 election don't have a chance to challenge him. Philippine government forces mark Independence Day on Monday amid ongoing battles with Islamist militants in the south. Bomb blasts rocked Malawi City as the national flag was raised. At least 58 security forces have been killed in street battles and daily government airstrikes in Malawi after May 23rd when Islamist militants overran the city. The military claims only 20 civilians have been killed along with more than 100 militants. In the capital, Manila, the Philippine government said Islamic State militants were inactive in Southeast Asia and allied countries should cooperate. Meanwhile, activists protested nearby against the U.S. military involvement in the fighting in Malawi. A controversial figure led off the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York today. Oscar Lopez Rivera was in the first float. He is a former member of a Puerto Rican nationalist group linked to deadly bombings in the 1970s and 80s. He was released from prison last month after President Obama commuted his sentence for seditious conspiracy. Many groups threatened to boycott the parade over plans to honor Lopez Rivera. The parade kicked off as voters went to the polls in Puerto Rico to decide whether the struggling U.S. territory should become the 51st state. For the fifth time in 50 years, Puerto Ricans went to the polls on Sunday to decide whether to become the 51st state of the United States, seek independence, or keep the status quo. Voter Wanda Cruz Rosa said statehood would be good for Puerto Rico, her kids, and grandkids. Puerto Ricans have had U.S. citizenship for the past century, but they don't pay federal taxes, vote for American presidents, or receive as much federal funding as U.S. states. The referendum comes as Puerto Rico's economy is crumbling. Billions of dollars in debt, the bankrupt island is struggling with failing schools and crushing poverty. Nearly half a million Puerto Ricans have moved to the U.S. mainland in the past decade, many seeking better jobs. At New York's annual Puerto Rican Day Parade, many people said they hoped for statehood. It's the best thing that um, Puerto Rico can go through right now with all the debt that they have. Why would it help Puerto Rico if it becomes I mean, overall, if we were treated equal, equal citizens in the United States, I think it would be a great thing. Those who oppose statehood warned Puerto Rico could struggle even more financially because it could be forced to pay millions in federal taxes or lose its cultural identity. This statue was at the center of an armed protest in Houston over the weekend. On Saturday, protesters, some with Confederate flags and guns, rallied in front of the Sam Houston statue, protesting against its possible removal. We want to preserve our country. Those of us that are here, whether it be patriots, whether it be veterans, uh, up to as old as ourselves, 
we're not having it. It's not going to be done. The sculpture has stood in the city park since 1925. There has been speculation about removing it because Houston owned slaves. While the former governor is credited with eventually convincing Texas to become a U.S. state, some believe him being a slave owner shouldn't be overlooked. For onlookers who passed by Saturday's protest, they say seeing guns in the park was disturbing. Free speech is important and everyone's granted that. I just, I get nervous when I see that many weapons in one place. The park, shared space, everyone comes here. So it felt a little more intrusive. Southern cities like New Orleans are facing fierce opposition to remove Confederate monuments. The city in May took down the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, making it the fourth controversial landmark to be removed. But the protesters in Houston are determined to prevent that from happening in their state. This isn't Louisiana. This isn't California. This is Texas. And we're going to stand strong. A New Jersey high school student under uh, New Jersey high school, that is to say, under fire after President Trump's name is removed from two students yearbook photos. You can see them wearing the name on their clothing and another student's quote from the president also excluded. Now, the school says they have no policy preventing students from expressing their political views. And it was all within the dress code. So what happened exactly? So tell us what you know. You got your yearbook when? Last week at about Wednesday. All right. And you opened it up. Very excited to see that sweater that you're well, wearing right yes, there. My... And, and what'd you see? Um, it wasn't there. It was cropped out of the yearbook, as well as my sister's quote was cropped out of the... Uh, was not put into the yearbook. Right. And we should put, we should, and we can put up the, the images. It wasn't just that your photo was cropped. Somebody photoshopped Trump off that. And it wasn't just with you, was it? It was with another student uh, in my grade. And so when you put all these stories together, there's definitely something going on. There was a deliberate attempt to censor and to silence someone's freedom of speech. And there's the other student. Is, his name is Grant? Grant, yeah. All right. <laughs> and clearly, Grant's shirt has it been so photoshopped. Yes. You, there's no doubt about what had happened there. The American Mall was once the go-to destination for many shoppers looking for bargains and suburban teenagers looking to have a place to hang out. But the rise of Amazon and changing trends in fashion have turned some malls into modern day ghost towns. Once popular chains like Wet Seal, Aeropostale, and Pacific Somewhere have filed for bankruptcy. Other larger retailers like Sears, Kmart, JCPenney, Macy's, and Kohl's have been forced to close stores. Several of these chains have announced layoffs as well. Amazon is a big problem for all these companies. The king of e-commerce now sells just about everything. It is even starting its own line of clothing, and Amazon is also opening up more and more of its own brick and mortar stores. Meanwhile, Walmart has been making a bigger bet on digital, and that may lure some customers away from the mall too. It now owns Jet.com, online women's apparel retailer ModCloth, and other e-commerce sites. This is making it more difficult for mall-based retailers to compete. Gap and Abercrombie & Fitch, once red-hot brands for younger shoppers, are struggling to stay relevant too. This has hurt urban malls particularly hard, with big shopping centers in Cleveland, Detroit, and other cities closing in recent years. Photographer Seth Lawless got a look at what happens to malls after they fail. Left abandoned and neglected, the giant buildings slowly fall apart. Everybody saw it as a dead mall. This used to be the site of the old Granite Run Mall outside Philadelphia. This used to be like the food court. This was very <laughs> close to the food court. Developer Michael Markman is giving the area a 21st century makeover. What makes it different? You know, what's different about this is, so there's a lot of malls being redeveloped around the country because malls are dying everywhere. What we did was really, really aggressive. We took down the whole interior portion of the mall. First building B. Building Markman is going to replace the old mall with a complex of buildings for shopping, entertainment, apartments, and a healthcare facility. We have about twice as much retail square footage per capita than uh, any other country in the world. Architecture professor Ellen Dunham Jones says reimagining old malls is becoming a necessity. It's estimated there are about 1,000 malls across the country. Around one third are at risk of failing. In Rhode Island, the historic Westminster Arcade found new life after adding apartments to the second floor. 
An old strip mall in Tennessee was converted into a church. And the Hundred Oaks Mall in Nashville survived after Vanderbilt constructed a health facility next to the stores. We see a lot of malls that are turned into medical clinics, turned into community colleges, or any all range of educational facilities. This is the future. Markman says the first phase of the new property is set to open in May 2018. E-money purchases through stored value cards are commonplace in Japan, but a sudden fever is taking hold here for Bitcoin, and it's now being accepted at some major electronics stores and soon by one airline. New legislation effective this year recognizes digital, virtual, and cryptocurrencies and regulates their dealers. All of that is leading to a spike in Bitcoin's value and popularity. Tokyo Brewpub manager Kenjiro Miyazaki says that for customers, Bitcoin is speedy and convenient. We generate a QR code when the price is entered on tablet computer, and customers read it with their cell phones and send us their Bitcoin as payment. And with Bitcoin's surge in value, he foresees increasing usage. For several months now, Bitcoin value has been increasing. For buyers and sellers, it's recently been climbing. I think more and more people will use it. Despite the risks and complications of using Bitcoin, industry experts say that Bitcoin vending machines similar to this one will soon be on the rise in Japan. Convenient, volatile, or risky, the currency's users in Japan say that Bitcoin is now unstoppable. Bitcoin technically is, a, or fundamentally, is superior than fiat currency. And wait until you see your mom and your dad and your grandma using Bitcoin, just like they were using Facebook. Torrential rain has drenched China's central region since Saturday, causing roads and air routes to be cut off, as well as severe flooding in urban areas. Nanjing saw its worst downpour in 112 years on Saturday, with 230 millimeters of precipitation in 10 hours, forcing hundreds of thousands of residents to evacuate. Nationwide, at least six people died and three others remain unaccounted for after torrential rain hit southern China from Thursday to Saturday. So it was like a snowstorm of hail. Ron Bush didn't expect he'd need a snowblower in June. The storm happened quickly. 15, 20 minutes is all it took and it looked like we had a blizzard. It hit hard, it hit fast, it hit loud. The hail was incredible. As you can tell. Liz Berkelow lives across the street from Ron on 109th Avenue. Well, we shoveled the driveway and then they came and plowed and we shoveled the driveway again. City crews even brought in a front end loader. Kind of unbelievable. <laughs> Mother Nature decides to say hello every once in a while. Anoka County dispatchers say there were no reports of injuries due to the weather in Coon Rapids, but there was property damage. We've got screens that are shredded, uh, holes in the siding. Um, all of our plants and stuff are destroyed. And as you can tell by the yard, we're going to have a lot of stuff to do this summer. It's a touching photo of a dad walking his daughter to her last day of high school. Now, look at this. It's the same dad and daughter on the girl's first day of kindergarten. We found the picture, decided that we were going to uh, just do it over again, just for memories. And I was all for it. I mean, my dad just had that kind of relationship. Brittany Gaylor posted the photos on Twitter, where they've received more than 63,000 likes. My heart just melted, goes one comment. One dude even posted this picture of himself crying. Others point out how dad Jason hasn't aged a day in almost 13 years. Uh, I've never got that many compliments or... <laughs> you know, questions about my skincare. 